With today's video, we are actually starting our last full unit of AP Stats. In chapter 12, we hit on some highlights, but we move pretty fast through it. You're not going to see the same usual chapter test that you did the rest of the year. So chapter 11 is kind of it, the last big chapter and topic that we have to talk about here in our course. And in order to get into this idea and this new topic and figuring out what's going on, we're starting the chapter off with a little investigation using M&Ms. Now, in previous years, I have actually like passed out M&Ms in class and stuff like that. And maybe if you're watching this in the future, we'll be doing that again. But for this year, I'm making the video in 2021, um, we're not going to be eating the M&Ms in class, and instead we're going to be looking at some kind of like fictional data, but I'll bring you guys candy at some point to make up for the fact that we're not doing it together. So, the M&M websites used to have the kind of color distribution published online. So they would actually say on their website, as of 2009, oh, 13% of our M&Ms are red, 13% are brown, 24% are blue, etc. But after 2009, they actually removed that information from the website. So they no longer say on their website how many M&Ms or what percent of M&Ms are each of the different colors. So what we might want to investigate right here is whether that distribution is still true, if it still is the same or if changes have been made since they removed that information from the websites. So if you look at what we're trying to analyze right here, we are analyzing a categorical variable. We want to know M&M color. We did categorical variables in earlier chapters with P. P would be the percents that you are or are not something, wearing glasses, not wearing glasses, or whatever. So P was good for categorical variables but only when there were two options, two binary options. What we have going on here is color, but there are more than just those two binary possibilities. We've got lots of options, blue, red, yellow, et cetera, for what color you could end up being. So we're gonna take a random sample of 50 M&Ms, and we're gonna observe what color we get for each of those 50 M&Ms. And in class, we would do this and actually draw our own sample. This is fictional data based on like a previous year. I've done this here. But out of our 50 candies, this is the number we got of each color. So we have our actual sample right here. And then what we're going to want to do is decide if there's convincing evidence that what we got in this sample right here actually shows, hey, what Eminem used to say is true up there doesn't work anymore. It must be different. That's what we're trying to analyze in this problem. So in class, we would do this as a little investigation, give you guys a chance to think about what to do with these numbers and the original percentages up here. This would be a good opportunity. I do encourage you to kind of pause me and think this through a little bit. What could we do with those numbers? to decide what kind of evidence we actually have. And when you're making that decision, um, I do have a few hints for how you can go about taking that data and making a test statistic. So here are some kind of questions to think about. And here are a few hints to consider when you're developing your test statistic. I'm gonna go ahead in a second and just show you guys how to do it, but I do encourage you, take a little time with that table and see where it takes you. All right, so you have hopefully had a chance to think through this on your own, and I'm going to walk you through what we're actually going to do here. The first thing we would want to do, these blue numbers are what we actually got. It's what we observed in our sample. We want to know what we were even supposed to get in the first place, or in other words, what we would expect to see. So the first step in doing one of these problems is to find what's called the expected counts. Expected counts are going to be based on the percentages in the original problem. There were supposed to be 13% of the candies that are red. Well, 13% of 50 ends up being 6.5. Obviously, you can't have 6.5 red candies out of um, 50. That's not possible to have a decimal there. We're still going to leave it as a decimal, though, when we actually do these. So, we got three reds. We were supposed to see 6.5 red. So clearly there's a discrepancy in what was going on with red. Brown was also 13%. 
So that means we would also expect to see 6.5 browns. We were a little low on brown as well. Uh, not as bad as we were with red, but we were off by a bit there. And if we keep going on using that same sort of setup, there were supposed to be 14% yellow, 16% green. That turns out to be seven yellow and eight green that we were looking for. So actually the yellow, we hit dead on. We got exactly what we were supposed to get. The green, we were one M&M &M too low. And then with our last two here, orange was 20, blue was 24. So that's 10 and 12 we would expect to see. Uh, we had a lot more orange than we thought we were gonna see. And we had a little bit more blue than we were expected to see. So those expected counts right there still add up to 50. That red list of numbers represents what we thought we should see. And the question is, well, okay, I've got my actual blue data and I've got my red expectation. What should I do with those two things? And hopefully you guys would have thought, oh, subtract them. That's what we do pretty frequently is we subtract things to compare the two lists. I'm gonna take the observed number, the blue, minus the red. So I'm gonna get a negative 3.5 for my observed minus expected here. A negative number means I got less than I was supposed to. That makes logical sense. I only got three, I was supposed to get 6.5, I'm 3.5 low. So that's why we subtract in this order. I would have a negative 1.5 here, a zero, negative one, positive five, and positive one. Then the question becomes, well, what would I do with those green numbers? How do I take those and put them into sort of one combined total? Adding is a good choice, but if you add them right now, they're all gonna cancel out. We've talked about that before. This actually should sound kind of familiar. This is like what we did with standard deviation back in like chapter one. If we add them now, they're gonna wash each other out. So rather than do an absolute value, which is like tricky to work with in advanced math, we're gonna go for the squared option like we would do before. So we're gonna take each of these guys right here and we're gonna end up squaring them. I'll change my color for that. And that will make them into positive quantities that won't wash each other out. So we're gonna take each of these guys and we're gonna end up squaring them. So a 3.5 squared is 10, nope, 12.25. We got a 1.5 squared, et cetera, et cetera. So 2.25, 0, 1, 25, and 1. Now, we could take those numbers by themselves and just add them up, get a total. But here's the thing. It's actually important to look at how many M&Ms were in each group. Let me explain that in a little more detail here. If I was supposed to see 100 red M&Ms and I got like 98, not that big of a deal. Two M&Ms off when I was supposed to see 100, that's not terrible. But if I'm supposed to see four red M&Ms and I see two, I'm still off by only two. But that difference seems a lot more important when the numbers are so small. Then I'm off by 50% compared to being off by like eh, 2% in the first situation. Again, 100 versus 98 is way different than four versus two. So what we're actually gonna do with these numbers here to figure out like how big of a deal it is, we're actually gonna end up dividing them by what we were supposed to get. So my next step in this process, we have our observed minus our expected. And I will summarize this later. This is just kind of informal writing right now. We're gonna divide these by what we were supposed to get in the first place, which is our expected number. So basically I'm gonna take my purples and I'm gonna divide by those reds. And I'm gonna pause for a second to do that because that's gonna be a little bit more tedious. So I'll come back with that answer shortly. All right, so again, what I did here is I took my purple squared numbers, divide by my red, which is what I was supposed to get, and I got these quantities in like cyan right here. So this little number at the bottom is all of those guys added up. That 4.9, 
by itself is like, ugh, what is it saying? I don't, I don't know. Like it's hard to interpret that number by itself, but it's an accumulation of how far off each of our numbers was, okay? Now, if you look at that 4.9, which is kind of meaningless in of itself, we don't really understand what that 4.9 is saying, but look at the ones that made the biggest difference and contributed the most to that 4.9. It looks like the reds had a lot to do. They were worth almost half of my thing right here. And the blues were actually, sorry, the oranges were actually a little bit over half. If you look at what happened, I had way too many oranges, five more than I was supposed to. And I had quite a bit less reds than I was supposed to. So these teal numbers are like, oh, what are, what are they telling me? I don't know. But bigger numbers tend to mean things that are like crazier than they were supposed to be. So that 4.934 is the, called the test statistic for our problem. And I will summarize this process in this video and the next one. Probably I'll save that till the next video here. But we got this accumulated totals that somehow represents like how far off we were. So I addressed all of these in here. This test statistic that we calculated is actually something brand new for us here. It is called a chi-square test statistic. This guy right here, C-H-I, is pronounced chi. Like, I guess if I was gonna spell that phonetically, K-A-I maybe, chi-square. Don't call it chai or chi or something like that, it's chi. So make sure you're saying that correctly. The symbol, for chi-square, chi is like a weird Greek letter. It's an X with like a rounded side. You'll either see it like this or you'll see it like this. So it's either an X with curvy guys on both sides or just on the one side right here. So either of these, any of these here, it's but I'm a little rusty, I haven't made chi-squares in a while. Any of those are acceptable. It's like an X, but with a curvy side to it. And the formula, for chi-squared, for getting your test statistic, we took our observed numbers minus what we expected to happen. So observed minus expected, that was blue minus red way up here. After we subtracted them, we squared them to make them all into positive quantities. And then to decide how big of a deal they were, we divided by what we expected to see and then we added all of those things together. So it looks really intense, but that's kind of what happens when we were making our test statistic earlier. So our chi-square test statistic ended up being 4.934. We'll review how to do that more in a later video, in the next video. For now, just go with it. Also, there's no like square rooting this or anything like that. Chi-square is just something we like just that's the symbol. Don't do a square root or anything. It's just a new variable right here, this chi-square guy. He's about 4.934. And if we wanted to decide, well, shoot, is that a big deal? Does 4.9 mean it's convincing? Is it not? We just have no way of knowing right now. What we'd have to do is repeat this process lots of times. We do another set of 50, get a sample, find our chi-square, another set of 50, and do that again and again and again until we figured out what was up. So what we'd really need to do is just repeatedly take samples of 50 and graph what we get each time. We got a 4.9. Maybe the next time we do the same process, and I don't know, we get like a 6.2. And we would just take lots of samples and calculate the chi-square test statistic each time. We're not gonna do that in this video. What I have here, what I'm basically describing to you all is what's called a simulation. And when you do a simulation over and over, this is an example of what you would get if you kept on doing this 50, 50 at a time repeatedly. We got an answer of 4.9. Turns out a 4.9 isn't all that special. If we had got something like this up here, we'd be like, whoa, 
This sample is pretty crazy. I bet Eminem changed things. I bet it's not the same. But we're sort of in that pedestrian middle of the area zone. It's like, ah, 4.9 could be true, could not be true. Like it just isn't anything convincing. So based on the evidence at hand, even though we did get M&Ms that were different than what Eminem promised they would be back in 2009, the differences weren't quite large enough for us to really be blown away and be convinced that Eminem changed their formula. We'll talk more about this in our next video.